Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you here on this beautiful day in Beulah Baptist Church. We're just so thankful that the good Lord has allowed all of you to come and worship with us today. And just so good to see so many smiling faces. It really is. We hope your experience here today will draw you closer to the Lord. Um, we'll begin with some announcements. Um, of course, I want to call your attention to the bulletin. I'll always be looking at the bulletin. We've, we've got everything sort of planned out there on the back page. But I do want to call your attention to next Sunday morning. Our schedule is a little different. We're having a Mother's Day breakfast at 8.30. So please keep that in mind, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's something that we use to invite the whole family, you know, and if, you know, invite your mother, bring your mother, or, or just come and celebrate what she has done in your life if she can't be here with us that day. But bring the whole family. Starts at 830 we're going to have a breakfast and all for everyone, and then at the end of that, we'll go right into our normal Sunday school uh, hour. So keep that in mind. Also, put on your calendars about May the 22nd. That is our next church business meeting. So please keep that in mind. It's a Sunday afternoon. We start at 5 o'clock with a potluck supper, and then the meeting starts at 6 o'clock. So, so put that on your schedule. Because if you're a member of Beulah Baptist Church, you want to be involved. You want to come and hear what's going on, hear what the plans are for the summer and the fall, and... And, and be involved and, and vote your conscience. Vote what God is, is speaking to you in your heart. And your participation is greatly wanted. Um, remind the deacons that there's a deacons meeting today after the worship service. It'll probably it'll take about a half an hour, I think. So if you will, keep that in mind and we'll meet in the uh, choir room after uh, worship service today. Announcements, I think you, did you have an announcement? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to remind all of our ladies that um, when WMU's not meeting today because we have an annual meeting this month and it's going to be, um, it's in the bulletin, it's going to be on May the 12th at 7 p.m. at Four Mile Creek. I will be going, so if anybody wants to ride with me, just let me know ahead of time and you can meet me at the house or I can get, pick you up somewhere, whatever. And also, um, this is my week to have chemo, so I'm asking for prayers because God hears our prayers and God answers prayers. So, thank you. Any other announcements? All right, let's continue with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much that you can bring us into your house this morning, Father. And, and we pray so much for those, Father, who... Uh, because of where they live or the country they live in, that they have to actually uh, struggle to worship. We, we can come of our own free will here, Father, and we thank you for that. We, we thank you for watching over us and helping us and, and, and forgiving us of our sins because we know we're a sinful people, Father. We pray for our country. Our, our country seems to be uh, headed in the wrong direction, and we pray that you would help us in some way turn things around, Father. Help us to be bold in speaking out the gospel to those who do not know. But show us your presence today, Father. Be with us. Inspire us through song and through message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I, I will call your attention, if you would. We will have a little missionary moment here this morning. Sandra's not with us, so I'm going to call your attention to the bulletin on the third page there. And you'll notice that the spotlight this week is on Wesley and Alicia Weinbarger, church planters at Travelers Church, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And they want us to pray for sojourners to find a home within our church family and for them to witness the transformative presence of Jesus that will lead them into the harvest. So if you will, keep them, keep them in prayer this week because we know prayer works. Prayer has power. And everyone needs to be praying every day for something in their lives. So we, we would pray that you would... Uh, would, would, would see that and that you would help these people by offering them prayers. Um, 
Now, let's continue this morning with our opening hymn number 159. Uh, Christ the Lord is risen today. Would you please stand? We come now to a time when uh, I get to introduce the pastor this morning, and, but he's no stranger to us. He's been here many times, and we're just so fortunate to have Dr. Gordon Fort come back and bring us the gospel this morning. Gordon, would you come and bring us on? Let's have a word of prayer together. Father, this morning, it's good to be here together in your house to worship together as a community of family and friends and neighbors. We're glad that we have the freedom to come here together and worship you without fear. And Father, we thank you for your word today, and we pray that it would speak to our hearts. We thank you for the gift of music and those uh, poets who wrote the words of so many of these songs that we sing to glorify and praise your name, to speak to us about the incredible truths of your word. We thank you for each person here today, for each family represented, and we do want to pray for Miss Ginger in this request uh, for her going through chemo this week, that your hand of blessing and peace would rest upon her, that your healing hand would also continue just to keep her body strong. Lord, we thank you today for all your good gifts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll be singing the hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? Our offertory hymn is hymn number 136. Hymn number 136. Uh, let's stand together as we sing that.
Let's pray for our offering time. Father, you love a cheerful giver. Now look into our hearts today and remind us that every good and perfect gift comes from your hand of grace. And as we give our offerings and tithes, we're just giving back to you a portion of what you've entrusted to us so that your work here in our church of Beulah, around our community, around our state, and around the world can take place and others might know this good news that we have. Bless the gifts today and use them for your service. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. want to say amen? Amen. 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 I, I, I love that. It's one of my favorite uh, hymns uh, to sing for the Lord's Supper. So thank you. Thank you for that choir. If you have your Bible, we'll turn to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. And uh, just building, uh, if you weren't here at Easter, but 
just building on the foundation of what I shared at Easter time about the new covenant and the meaning of the new covenant. And I'm so uh, thankful that today um, we're going to have the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper uh, after the service uh, message part of it as a kind of a benediction together as a community. And uh, so this morning, we're just going to be looking at the foundation of the Great Commission because it all, it all ties together with what Jesus said when he was in the upper room with his disciples and uh, had the last meal with them and where he instituted uh, this celebration that will take place here in our service today. And uh, I, as I was reading that text about the new covenant that's in his blood, for me, I can never take the Lord's Supper again in the same way whenever we come to the place where we take this cup that represents the blood of Jesus Christ and the meaning of that. And uh, part of the significance of that is in this text uh, that we'll read this morning from Romans chapter 10. So if you have your Bible, if you'd look at Romans chapter 10, and I'm actually going to back up to verse 11 before we hit uh, verse 13. Romans chapter 10, we'll begin in verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be ashamed, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Now here's the most incredible statement, I think, in all of the scripture because of its implications. And listen, just listen uh, to what this statement is because here's what it says. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I tell you, there is a real good place. If you've never ever said amen in church before, that right there is where you ought to say amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. If you've nev never said an amen out loud in church, even if you just want to say the words and don't make a sound, just say amen because... I'll tell you why. You're counting on that. If you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're counting on the truth of that verse. You're putting your faith and trust in God's word that when he said that, he meant exactly what he said. That's what you're counting on. You're living your life as a believer with a hope that God means what he says here. Whosoever calls on my name, I absolutely will save you. Amen. <laughs> now, I am so glad that he didn't say, I will save you if you're smart enough. Because I met some guys in this church that would be in big trouble. <laughs> I, 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 I will save you um, if you're rich enough. There's a lot of us in here really glad he didn't say that. I will save you if you're good enough. Oh. <laughs> oh, I wish I could have known some of you men when you were teenagers. <laughs> Oh, I know you're glad that uh, he didn't say that. And, and you can put any comparison in there. He says, the Jew nor the Greek. He's no respecter of persons, Jew or Greek. Now, you could put any comparison. You could say, uh, he's no respecter of, of persons, Jew or Greek, male or female, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, Nigerian or Chinese. Republican or Democrat, aren't you glad that he didn't say that? He didn't put a, a party around this. He didn't say, what are your politics? I need to know before I save you. No, he didn't say that. Aren't you glad he didn't say that? Hair or no hair? He didn't say that. Aren't some of you glad he didn't say that? He didn't make this conditional. 
That's the point of that verse. That's why that verse is so incredible. Because if you've been anywhere in the world, then you've seen somewhere some pretty bad stuff. If you've been in the slums, you've seen some pretty bad stuff. If you've ever been in a center that takes care of addiction, you've heard some pretty bad stories. If you ever talk to law enforcement, by the way, uh, Leanne and I live in West End in Short Pump, and uh, they put in a new speed limit, 25. Now just imagine, okay? Now it's been in since November. And so I come home and I see lights, not the good kind, <laughs> poor person. And then I took my dog for a walk because I wanted to go see who was in that car. And that was my excuse. You know, if you have a dog, you can get away with anything if they're on a leash, right? So I'm walking our dog Zoe and I walk right by to see that policeman met Mitch handing him out a ticket. We went around the corner, came back, and he had someone else. He told me in about two and a half hours, he handed out 52 tickets. I was in my yard doing some work, just watching. It was so much fun. <laughs> and one lady pulls up to this stop sign. He's parked right in front of her. And she rolls through the stop sign. <laughs> and so he, Mitch just looks over at me like, so he just follows her, puts his lights on, pulls her over right in front of my yard. And she starts fussing. You know, I've got a good driving record. I'm in a hurry. I don't have time for this. And he says, yes, ma'am. But you know, he said, you roll through the stop sign right in front of me. What can I do? So he goes back to check up her driver's license. He comes back and I hear her say, I bet you didn't even look up my driver's license and see my good driving record. He said, ma'am, you said you were in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, afterwards, I got to talking to Mitch. You know what, poor guys, they, they just don't believe anybody anymore, right? I mean, they've just met so many incorrigible people. Now, there's some good people. I mean, he did meet me after all. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he didn't check my record. <laughs> but, you know, aren't you glad he didn't say, if you're good enough, if you're cleaned up enough? I told you when I started... Uh, pastoring. I was in a country church in Texas, and I met, uh, you know, a couple out there in the country, pretty poor, living in a one-room shotgun house, no running water in the house. And James, he was a bad alcoholic. And he told me, preacher, when I get cleaned up, I'll come to church. I said, James, praise God, you don't have to get cleaned up to come to church. He'll take you just like you are. I'm glad he said that. Whosoever calls on my name. You know, if you could have done this by yourself, you wouldn't have needed God. You could have cleaned up your act, sorted your problems out by yourself. If you could have paid for your own sin, you wouldn't have needed God. But brothers and sisters, there's nothing I can do to pay the debt I owe. And I'm so glad that Jesus died on the cross in my place so that this statement could be made and is absolutely true. Whosoever, young or old, rich or poor, educated, uneducated, cleaned up, not cleaned up, whoever you are, if you'll call on his name, he'll save you. He means that. Oh, he means that. Now, I wish we just hit the uh, pause button there and say sermon over. Let's have the Lord's Supper. It's all good. But we can't do that. And we can't do that because of the implications of that statement that we just read. Because you see, Paul 
is going to lay out for us the implication of that statement, of what that means to me as a believer. What does that mean to me as a church? Now, because of what I do, if you don't know, I work with the International Mission Board. Leanne and I just were in Alaska for a pastor and uh, their wife uh, retreat and uh, seeing the work that they're doing up in Alaska to share the gospel in a very difficult spiritual setting, very independent people there. Uh, last Sunday afternoon, Leanne and I were on snowmobiles going to visit someone who's off grid, who attends the Montana Creek Baptist Church. And as we get up to their house, it's about like five or six miles in a trail through the woods to just get to their house. There's, <laughs> there's a chain across the entrance to their property and on, in big letters it says, no trespassing. <laughs> and guess what that means in Alaska? <laughs> yeah, it means, it means if you come under this sign, you better have a gun. <laughs> it means no trespassing, independent, strong-willed, leave me alone, let me do what I want to do. And the soil to share the gospel there is very difficult. So I'm reminded of the implication of this verse. Because here's what the apostle's going to say. Absolutely true. Whoever calls on his name, I'll save you. But now listen to what Paul now asks us. He's going to give you four questions. Remember, Paul is a lawyer, trained as a lawyer. So he's not asking a question. You know, a good lawyer never asks a question that what? That they don't already know the answer to. That's right. So he already knows the answer. He just wants you to answer it in the way he expects you to. Because if you answer the first question in the way he expects you to, he's going to draw you down to a conclusion that you'll have to accept. So understand that right up front. This is a legal frame of an argument that would have been made in a courtroom. So here's what he says. First question. How can you call on him in whom you have not believed? In other words, you just said, whoever calls on him, He'll save you. So he asks you a question. But how can you call on him to save you if you don't believe in him? What would the answer be? You can't. If you don't put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he can't save you. He wants to save you. The Bible says it's not his will that anyone should perish. But the Bible also said there's only one name given amongst men whereby you must be saved. And it's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says the road to destruction is wide. Person wants to go to hell, it's very easy. But he said the gate to eternity is narrow. Why? Not because it's difficult, but because it's exclusive. That's why it's narrow. In Jesus' name alone. Now, people say, well, you Christians, you know, y'all are, are kind of uh, narrow-minded. No, <laughs> we're not narrow-minded. Because what do we believe? Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, he will absolutely save you. He's paid the penalty for my sin. He died on the cross in my place. The Son of God, Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the earth. And that's why Jesus, when he held up that cup at the Last Supper, said, this cup is the new covenant, the new agreement between me and my Father. And because of this new covenant, we have access to the throne room of heaven. So he says... How can you call on him if you don't believe in him? Then he asks you a second question. How will you believe in him of whom you haven't heard? In other words, how can you believe in someone you never heard of? My mama was a pediatrician in Africa where they were missionary doctors. Every year we lived in a kind of rural area that was less than sanitary. So every year, once a year, Mama would line the five boys up and deworm us. She'd give us this medicine 
to deworm us like a pack of dogs, you know? Five boys, boom, boom, boom. Well, I missed the dose one day, and uh, that evening, Mama was waiting for me after I took my bath. I said, uh, Gordon, here's your worm medicine. And I took my worm medicine, and it tasted different. And I said, Mama, that had a chalky taste to it. She had a little frown here. That's a bad sign on a doctor. <laughs> and uh, she disappears, and she comes back, and she says, now, Robert Gordon, that's my first name. And that was always bad when she used that. Now, Robert Gordon, you're going to be okay. That's another bad thing for a doctor to tell you. <laughs> Ginger, watch for that this week, okay? <laughs> be careful. You're going to be okay. But she said, by mistake, I gave you calamine lotion. <laughs> you know? My son put it in the tank one day. <laughs> he, he kills fish? <laughs> Well, I told Mama, I said, you didn't kill the worms, but they weren't itching either. So there you, so there you go. There you go. Now, you know, uh, you know when a doctor is 100% perfect, did you know my mama, she was a great cook. We had a, we had a, wood, a wood stove that she cooked on. And, and, you know, when she cooked a pie, she'd have to turn it to get it to, to brown evenly, you know. But uh, Mama cooked dozens and dozens of delicious pies. But which pie do you think me and my brothers all remember? <laughs> the one, instead of baking soda, she put salt in it. <laughs> That's the one we remember. Oh, we were so bad. I took the first bite, and it was so salty. Do you think I warned my brothers? Oh, no. <laughs> I just sat there and waited. <laughs> you know what? After we all had a piece of salty pie, do you know what we did with the leftovers? Mama told us to throw it away. And so we went outside. She thought we did. We took it to the missionary neighbors. <laughs> Mama wanted you to have some of her pie. <laughs> now listen, if Mama moved into this neighborhood, you had your grandkids or your kids, and suddenly you have a medical emergency. And you need a doctor. I mean, right now, right now. Is it possible for you to call on her to come help you if you've never heard of her? No, it's not possible. You cannot believe in somebody that you never heard of. Then he asks a third question. He says, how will they hear Without, and here in the text, it uses the word preacher, but literally it means how will they hear without a herald? This word came from the Greek arena when they would get ready to compete in the Olympic Games. The athletes would wait outside the arena, and there was a big archway, and they would wait outside and inside the arena when the master of ceremonies was ready for the games to start, there was a balcony with a group of trumpeters, and he would indicate to them time to start. They would raise the trumpets, and they would caruso. They would blow a loud blast on their trumpet. When the athletes outside heard that, they knew it's time for us to go in. The games are starting, and they would make their way into the arena at the sound of the trumpet. Now, this word here is the word caruso. How will they hear without a herald, without a trumpeter, without someone who makes it clear to me? How will I know if someone doesn't explain it to me? I was preaching at Iron Bridge uh, over near Mechanicsville, and uh, this word is similar to a word used in Romans chapter 1. And they had a little orchestra up on the, on the platform, and it was mostly high school kids. And so I wanted to illustrate that word. And they had two high school teenagers who had trumpets. So I looked over and I said, boys, I want you to step up here and I want you to blow me a blast. Well, I caught them by surprise. You know, they were kind of fumbling around. Finally, they got up there and they went, beep. <laughs> and I said, that's terrible, man. <laughs> I said, nobody heard that. I said, come on, I want to see a blood vessel popping out of the top of your head. Come on. So those two boys, I mean, they really got with it. And I mean, they cut loose in that auditorium. And it was a loud blast. 
And after church, I was in the foyer meeting the people, and these two ladies came up to me, sisters. And this lady said, Brother Gordon, you about gave me a heart attack. <laughs> she said, I got the bulletin this week. I saw we're having this guest speaker and that you, you know, you were a missionary. And so she said, I called sister and I told her, I said, sister, I see we're going to have some missionary speaker or something. And then she said this, she said, I told sister, if God wanted me to be a missionary, he'd have to make it so clear to me that it would be like a trumpet blast. <laughs> oh, 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 you don't think God can make it clear to you? Oh, listen, when there's a heart here that wants to understand, God can make it very clear to us. But if in your heart you say, God, I'd like to really understand that, but I maintain the right of veto as to whether I'm going to do it or not. <laughs> uh, God's not going to play that game with us. You see, if, if you have a will to know, he says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. He doesn't play the game, let's make a deal. That's not how God works. When you have a desire to know, and that means, God, I want to know, and if you show me, I'm going to follow you and do what you tell me to do. Now, when he sees that in my heart, God is thrilled and delighted for me to know his will, and he can make it very plain, like a trumpet blast. So he says to us, the apostle now, follow his reasoning. He says, can he save you? If you don't believe in him, no. Can you believe in him if you've never heard about him? No. Can you hear unless somebody makes it clear to you, unless someone explains it to you? Will you understand unless somebody somewhere explains it to you? No. And then he says... Will anyone ever herald, will anyone ever go and speak about this unless what? Unless somebody sends them. See that? How will they preach unless they are sent? Now there is a, an, a really good word in the Greek. It's the word apostello. It's the word we get apostle from. And basically what it means is how will they preach unless someone sends them, and it's the idea of sending you with a message. In other words, if anyone ever asks you again, why do you people at Beulah Baptist Church, why do you give money so that we can send these missionaries? You tell them because of Romans chapter 10. Because we believe that lost people need to be saved. And we believe that lost people need to hear about Jesus. And we believe the way they will hear about Jesus is if we send someone with that message to deliver it to any place in this world where they've never heard it. See, that's what we believe. And so if anyone ever asks you again, why do you Baptists care about... See, when, when I travel and speak about this topic... I'll, I'll oftentimes, and you may feel this way, and you'll understand I agree with you. They'll say, don't we need missionaries right here in Beulah land? I mean, around here, aren't there lost people? Absolutely. So whose job is it to preach to them? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Point that finger right at you. Because you're the ones who live right in this community, right? Right? You're the ones who have this message in your heart, right? You're the ones who've heard this message, right? And if you're a member of this church and you've been born again, then you have a responsibility to share this message when God opens the door. It's our responsibility. Now, why do we send missionaries? Because you see, today in the world, there are places where there's no Bible, there's no church, there's not the first scripture in their language. 
There's no Christians in their community. So when we answer the questions that he asks here about the Sukutran people who are on islands off the coast of Yemen, off that coast of Yemen are a group of three little islands. The Sukutran people live there, about 127,000 of them. There are no churches there. There are no scriptures in their language. There's not even the shadow of a cross. If they woke up this morning and said, I want to know about God, and they go to mom and dad and say, Mama, can you tell me about God? And she'll say, I don't know anything about it. How about granddaddy? Nope. Not anyone in their history has ever known about him. When we hear about that, then here's what we believe about this text. How will they believe in someone they never heard of? How are they going to hear unless someone explains it to them? And how will anyone ever share that message unless there's somebody who sends them? See that? That's why this is the foundation of the Great Commission. It starts right across the street from the church, where you live, where I live. You never know when God will open a door. And you're the very person that he's prepared to share that message. For some reason, you're the one that God has assigned that responsibility to. Um, when I was a country pastor, I got to ride on horseback because people were a little bit surprised who thought they were living off the grid <laughs> out in the country. Uh, when someone comes riding up on a horse and says, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm the preacher. <laughs> and there was one house, I could never catch this guy at home. I'd knock on the door and there would be no answer. Finally, I got to thinking about that thing. So I knocked on the door and I ran around to the back of his house just in time to catch him run into the chicken pen. <laughs> he didn't want to see the preacher. Why? He knew. He knew he was lost. He knew he was lost and he knew he needed to be saved. But he knew if I follow Jesus, some things in my life are going to have to change. That's what he was struggling with. Now listen, you never know who you meet and where they are in their life. You may just be a little part. God may just want you to just drop in a little seed. And on that day, they may not get saved. But because you were faithful and just dropped that seed in there, the Holy Spirit has something to work with in their life. And you never know when that day will be. Leanne and I uh, were in South Africa. Our, our son had a viral infection. We'd had to medevac him from our village in Botswana. And uh, he was in critical uh, state with this infection going back in his head. We were sitting at a little restaurant in Johannesburg and we were kind of talking about it and uh, concerned about it. And uh, our daughter, Sarah, was playing and crawling on the table and we'd, just two years old, pull her down, you know. And then across the way from us in the restaurant, a man was watching us and he started laughing. So I looked over and I said, well, it's easy for you to laugh. You're by yourself. And this guy goes, no, 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 no. He's a South African guy. He said, don't, no, don't be offended. He said, I'm just laughing because if my daughter had been here, she'd be doing the same thing. She's about the same age as your daughter. And we met Mike Davis. He was an insurance underwriter and he was visiting in Johannesburg for a conference. And so he's looking at us and he says, you know, I said, I got a good job. I got a fine family. We're doing well. But he says, something is just missing in my life. And I just don't know what it is. And I said, well, Mike, let me just share with you the difference that Jesus has made in our lives. There in the restaurant, I just share the simple gospel with this guy. When I get through, he says, you know what? I know that's what I need. I said, Mike, you can pray right here in this restaurant. He said, right here? I said, sure. So this guy, Mike, leans from his booth over towards mine. I lean towards him. And in that restaurant, 
He prays and invites Jesus Christ to become the Lord of his life. Now, is it because I was a great evangelist? No. I don't know who in his life had been sowing that seed. You need something. You're missing something. And that had been stirring in his heart. And then God puts together a couple that were way up in the north part of Africa in Botswana, north of, of Botswana, down in a restaurant at just the right time when he's thinking about that in his heart. And he meets this couple who are struggling with a child who is critically ill, and he just sees there's something different about the way these people are acting. And it opens his heart. And we become that final link to his coming to faith. Now, friends, you have the same treasure. You see, you can't believe in someone you never heard of. You're never going to hear unless somebody somewhere explains it to you. But no one's ever going to do that unless there's somebodies who care enough to send that message out. Today, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. I told you at Easter, never, ever take this the same ever again. Because when you take that cup, you're acknowledging the truth of this text. That what Jesus did on the cross in shedding his blood established a new covenant with his Father. No longer do we have to obey the laws of the Old Testament in order to be right with God. No longer do we have to give so many sheep for my sin or a cow for my sin or two turtle doves for my sin. No longer do I have to go to a certain place to hear from a certain priest so that my sins can be forgiven. No, we have a high priest named Jesus who shed his blood on the cross and established a new covenant with his Father. And he offers us a gift of salvation. And today, if you're not saved... He is just waiting for you to accept that gift. But you have to put your faith and your trust in Him. We have to turn from our old life and turn to the life He offers us in this gift. And when we do, the Holy Spirit gives us a new birth, a spiritual birth. And we're born into the kingdom of heaven. And we become a child of God with a Lord and Savior Jesus who keeps the covenant with his Father. Let's pray together. As you're praying, I have an invitation hymn here in just a minute. Brother Buddy and I will be standing here at the front, and, and we're there just simply because an invitation is exactly that. It's just offering you an opportunity if God is speaking to your heart in some way that you want to make a public statement of your faith or you would just like to come and ask for prayer or there's something else you want to share that we can pray with you about, that's what the invitation's for. So Father, we thank you for this new covenant in the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that you could throw open the windows of heaven and you could herald from the throne room of heaven, whosoever will, let him come. You open wide the doors and you invite us all. And so we thank you today for this unspeakable gift that is ours. Let us hold this stewardship carefully because around us in our communities are people who've never heard this good news, and we are your messengers to deliver this message. May our hearts today be open that wherever you lead, we'll go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The hymn of invitation is hymn number uh, 489, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Hymn number 489, Let's stand together and sing 489. Brother Buddy and I will be here. If there's a decision on your heart you'd like to share with us, we'd be happy to hear it and happy to pray with you.
Let's be seated as we prepare for the Lord's Supper together. For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, hard to imagine, sitting at that table with those followers of his. They had no idea what he was doing, didn't understand because the events that were to take place in the days to come were to be very confusing to them. Because that wasn't the plan they had in their minds. Some of those disciples thought Jesus is going to reestablish the kingdom of David. And we're the inside followers. We're going to get special positions uh, in this new kingdom. And then Jesus did everything in the opposite way of what they expected. Uh, he would touch the lame and heal him. He would touch a Samaritan woman that they considered unclean. And they just watched this man and he didn't do anything that they expected. And here, they're having the Lord's Supper together. It's during Passover, the Feast of Passover. What was celebrated just before we had Easter. And during the meal, he picks up this bread that was unleavened to the Passover and he breaks it and he says to him, this is my body broken for you they didn't understand it that day but a few days later our Lord he was scourged beaten bruised hung naked on a cross, the most cruel way the Romans could think of to kill somebody. There on that cross, hanging between heaven and earth, rejected of men, this solemn moment, darkness covers the face of the earth. God wouldn't let anyone look on the agony of his son's face when he called out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So you can understand the lost humanity of Jerusalem. You can understand the lost Roman soldiers behaving like they did. But in the moment of his greatest hour of need, the throne room of heaven was veiled. Why? Because he who knew no sin became sin for us. His body broken for you.
This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Same way, after the meal was over, he took the cup. And here, I tell you, when I think about this, that he was giving us a new covenant, a new agreement. He held that cup up and he said, this cup, this cup, it's a new covenant in my blood. Once again, those disciples sitting around the table, they had no idea what this meant. But see, Jesus was putting something in place to help us here today. He knew that we as human beings, we forget. And so he wanted to institute something that would remind us every time we did of what took place at Calvary. See, if you want to understand the wrath of God, look at the cross. Look at the cross. What it costs us to be forgiven. Somebody had to pay the penalty for my sin. The cross showed us the wrath of God on sin. But if you want to look at the love and grace of God, look at the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Amen. And this cup right here is the covenant, the new covenant that you have, that I have in Christ, that gives us this incredible freedom that wherever you go today, you can tell anyone you meet, no matter how bad off they are, no matter what condition they're in, there's hope for you. <laughs> because whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, he'll save you. Why? Because of this new covenant in his blood. Praise be to God. This is the new covenant in his blood. As so often as we drink this cup, eat this bread, we're showing forth the Lord's death until one day the trumpet's going to sound. 
The windows of heaven are going to split wide open. The Lord Jesus is coming again. Until that day, let's remember him. Let's pray together. Father, what a blessing we have today to observe this Lord's Supper. May our hearts be encouraged and challenged and warmed that we may serve you well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let's stand together and we're going to sing Blessed Be the Time That Binds. this morning I want you to remember something we had an experience in the country of Malawi volunteer team been sharing out in the slums no street signs no house numbers so they came up with an idea if someone makes a decision in the house we're gonna put this bright sticker on their doorpost then if other teams come and they see that bright sticker they'll know we need to stop here and do some follow-up. Next year, a team was going out in the community. And there was an African man in the crowd. And he had a sticker <laughs> right here on his forehead. And he saw these Americans, and he goes through the crowd, he comes up to them, and he says, are you with my church? And they say, well, who are you? He said, well, last year, these people came to our house and shared the gospel with us, and I was saved. And then he said, no one else has come back. And he made this statement. I want to be found. I want to be found. Now, when we leave here today, this week, there's some people that got a sticker right here. And they're waiting for somebody to tell them, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, he will save you. And let me tell you what he did for me. Let's have a good week. You be blessed in his name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>